I want you to hit me as hard as you can. He loves punching people in the face and cuddling with chihuahuas. Sometimes he looks like a ruggedly handsome bad boy with a sparkle in his eye. And other times he looks like a post-apocalyptic disco grandma returning from battle. But he is always Mickey Rourke. He's a man of many characters and many faces. Actually, the evolution of Mickey's face has been called a symbol of Hollywood self-destruction by that independent magazine or website or what, whatever it is now. One of the most controversial and talented actors to ever grace the silver screen. He's everywhere. The man is a mystery, always leaving you guessing what he's gonna do next. And that goes for his movie roles and his personal life. But let's not get too personal. Actually, yeah, let's. Let's do it. That's why you're here, I think. I don't know. Why, why are you here? Why is, why, why is anybody here? Why am I here? But the real question is, why is Mickey Rourke not here? But like many Hollywood rebels, Mickey had his ups and downs. And when they were up, they were way up. And when they were down, they were way down. Everything Mickey does is to the extreme. And that includes winning and losing. And right now, it seems like we really haven't seen Mickey's face lately. All of his faces, we haven't seen any of them in a while. Which leads me to ask one simple yet profound yet vulgar question. What the f*** happened to Mickey Rourke? WTF. That the best you can do, you pansies. But to truly understand what the f**k happened to Mickey Rourke, we must start at the beginning. He was born on his birthday in Schenectady, New York, sometime around 1952. Mickey has actually never revealed his real age. It's one of his many mysteries. And he had a very violent and abusive childhood. So bad that Mickey refuses to talk about it. And in order to escape this abuse and control his anger, young Mickey took up boxing, and he spent nine years in the ring, sustaining numerous concussions, temporarily retiring in 1973 with a pretty good record. I think I don't really know anything about boxing, but it seems, it seems good to me. Rourke had no interest in acting until one day he took a role in a friend's play after the first actor dropped out. It was just a favor to a friend, but the acting bug bit him hard. And this would soon lead Mickey to venture off to the famed actor's studio, where it is rumored that he gave the best audition ever. He was so poor, but so passionate about his craft that sometimes he would go three days without eating in order to pay for acting classes. Early in his career, Rourke was predicted to become the next Brando, Marlon Brando, which is probably the best compliment you can give a young actor, especially at that time. And this young, passionate actor soon found work with small roles in big movies like Heaven's Gate and Steven Spielberg's World War II comedy, 1941. 1941, the most explosive comedy spectacular of all times. Then in 1981 came his big, big break in Body Heat. People finally took notice of Mickey Rourke in a small role he was only on screen for five minutes, but that's plenty of time for good old Mickey. And world famous legendary movie critic Roger Ebert, the guy with the thumbs, said that the best supporting work in the movie is done by Mickey Rourke. Rourke would next be featured in a strong ensemble cast for the Oscar nominated classic film Diner. Everybody loves Diner. Well, everybody who's seen Diner loves Diner. Mickey Rourke would win Best Supporting Actor from the Boston Society of Film Critics and the National Society of Film Critics. Yes, the critics loved this one, but the studio was very disappointed in the film's tone. They were hoping this would be like the next Porky's. And yes, it does have some, 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 uh, crude 80s sexual humor, but it, it has, it, it has heart and artistic integrity. Like, no offense, but it, 
again, it's not Porky's. But Diner did not light up the box office, only making $14 million. Which, yeah, $14 million? That's nothing. I mean, I, I, I blow my nose with $14 million. <laughs> yet, yet there was very strong praise for the chemistry between the actors in this film. They felt like real friends. <laughs> Once again. <laughs> I guess you're full. <laughs> then in 1983, Mickey Rourke would star opposite Matt Dillon in Francis Ford Coppola's Rumblefish. He played Motorcycle Boy, which is the best name for a character ever, and he read books about Napoleon in order to get into the mindset of Motorcycle Boy. Man, boy man. And Mickey Rourke is amazing in this movie. He's so cool, so quiet, so powerful. The film, costing $10 million, would only recoup $2.5 million at the box office. And the critics said the film was frustrating, and they felt the story was a letdown, but the visuals they thought were truly special, and they are, they're, they're right. It's, it's a, it's a gosh darn beautiful movie. Look at that. Look at that black, and that white. Oh, and look at those colorful fish. It's, it's kind of like a Sin City, which uh, we'll talk about later. And yes, Rumblefish, it's, it's probably my favorite Francis Ford Coppola film that isn't The Godfather, The Conversation, The Godfather Part 2, or Apocalypse Now. <laughs> Rourke would next star opposite Julia Roberts' brother, Eric Roberts, in The Pope of Greenwich Village, a film that the critics really enjoyed, noting the superb acting, and Mickey Rourke was, was one of the actors doing that superb acting. Yet again, Mickey had made a film that the critics loved, but wasn't exactly a hit at the box office. But yeah, people really like this one, check it out. Then Mickey Rourke would reteam with the legendary director of Heaven's Gate to make The Year of the Dragon in 1985. And a Hell's Angel person was hired to be Mickey Rourke's trainer for this film, who immediately got him into shape. The film would only make $16 million and kind of got mixed reviews. But this is one of Quentin Tarantino's favorite movies. If, if that means anything to you, sometimes that means something to people. Mickey Rourke would return to the world of the sexy time movie with Nine and a Half Weeks in 1986, a film that the critics called titillating. Yet standard. Actually, Fifty Shades of Grey, which I haven't seen or read, but I hear is a blatant ripoff. The lead character's name is even Grey, so there's that. But yeah, this movie, it drove everybody crazy, especially the ladies and the, the also the men who, who are interested in, 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 in Mickey. Everybody was like, oh, Mickey, you so fine, you so fine, you blow my mind. And the film was considered too steamy for American audiences, so it was heavily edited in its domestic release, where it bombed. But the international audiences, uh, you... Y'all got the unedited cut, and you, uh... You loved it. Because the film would make a hundred million dollars overseas. But the film would eventually find an audience on home video. And that would eventually make Mickey Rourke an A-lister, a household name. Like one of the top five famous people or mice named Mickey. And Nine and a Half Weeks would actually get a direct-to-video sequel 11 years later, but... It sucked. People had lost their appetite for strawberries, apparently. But yeah, let's get back to those 80s. How about 1987 when he made the movie Angel Heart? He went on to act alongside his idol, Robert De Niro. But it was not a match made in movie heaven. In fact, it was the beginning of a feud that still lasts to this day. Mickey was so eager to work with and get to know and befriend Mr. De Niro, but De Niro suggested that they do not speak or interact off camera, you know, for their characters or something. And yes, Mickey Rourke is a method actor too, but even he has his limits. I mean, come on, De Niro. Apparently, Robert De Niro wouldn't even let Mickey Rourke touch him. Which I don't, I don't, I don't know what that, that meant. I don't know why you want to touch Robert De Niro, but... And this refusal of friendship really hurt Mickey Rourke's feelings. And the two became quick enemies. And they would often turn their scenes into improv acting battles, trying to outact each other. Like a clash of the thespians. Like two prize fighters going at it, but instead of using their fists, they're using their acting skills. 
And of course, Mickey let his thoughts about Robert De Niro be known loud and clear to the public. Mickey Rourke actually said that he no longer looks up to the man. He looks through him, straight to his a-hole. Whatever that means. It sounds like a pretty sick burn, though. This decades-long bitter rivalry resulted in Robert De Niro blocking Mickey Rourke from being in Martin Scorsese's The Irishman in 2019. This could have been a pretty big comeback for Rourke, but De Niro put a stop to that. So yeah, uh, dissing De Niro can hurt your career, even years down the road. But Mickey, he don't care about that, he'll say whatever he wants. And I kind of respect that, I don't know. But yeah, back to Angel Heart, it's actually a great film. It failed to make back its $18 million at the box office, though. But hey, it's just money. And after years and years of analyzing this film, many people say that Mickey Rourke outacts Robert De Niro. But director Alan Parker did say that working with Mickey Rourke was a nightmare. Imagine that. But those offers from the Hollywood hotshots, they still kept pouring in. And Mickey would always choose his films based on their artsy-fartsiness rather than their box office potential. And this led to Mickey Rourke turning down many legendary roles that probably would have made him the biggest thing ever. Movies like Top Gun, Rain Man, Platoon, and Beverly Hills Cop. But he refused to play the Hollywood game and just did his own thing, even if it meant being a famous movie star who struggled to pay his mortgage. Then there was a film called A Prayer for the Dying in 1987. This was a major flop. It was a film about the IRA, which is always a controversial topic. And to prepare for the movie, he befriended real IRA members and went so far to get a real IRA tattoo on his real skin. And Mickey Rourke was actually very proud of this powerful drama that he had made. But when the studio got their hands on it, they chopped it up and turned it into a big dumb action movie. And it was so dumb that Mickey Rourke disowned the movie and told the studio that they should have never hired him. He said they should have gotten Chuck Norris to make this type of movie. Mickey Rourke is a terrorist who killed for a cause he believed in. Now he wants out. But it looks like the critics were split down the middle of this one. Some saying that Mickey Rourke was the saving grace of the movie, and others saying that his ridiculous Irish accent ruined everything. I saw myself laying on the street dying, not wanting to die. And this movie, A Prayer for the Dying, needed a prayer from dying at the box office. It made less than $2 million. And, of course, Mickey would go on to make some controversial political statements about the IRA and money he donated to the cause and such, such things, which led to lots of media troubles. And I think he was even banned from the UK. And then Mickey started publicly trash-talking the head of the studio, which led to even more troubles and more powerful bridges being burnt to the ground and then Rourke pissed on the ashes. And, of course, this did not help his career. But Mickey don't care, he's an artist. He's a poet, like Charles Bukowski, which he played in his next movie, Barfly, 1987. Oh, beautiful, Ooh. Rourke would be nominated for an Independent Spirit Award for his performance in this film based on the life of the famed poet, writer, drinker. And many critics said that you could actually feel the pain coming off the screen. That's some acting right there, wow. And the film received mostly positive reviews, pointing out the superb performances by Faye Dunaway and Mickey Rourke. But yet again, high praise from those critics did not translate to box office dollars. It only made like $4 million. That's nothing. Then Mickey Rourke would assume the pseudonym Eddie Cook and pin a movie called Homeboy. That's right, he's a writer too. It's about a self-destructive boxer who continues to fight even though the next punch could kill him. They always say, write what you know, right kids? The film was a blink and you'll miss it affair with a very limited theatrical release, but has since gone on to be very appreciated in later years. After appearing in the film Francisco about the life of St. Francis of Assisi, Rourke would star in the revenge thriller, Johnny Handsome. And with a bit of ironic foreshadowing, 
He plays a man with a disfigured face. Go figure. <laughs> and surprise, surprise, Rourke and the film's director, Walter Hill, actually got along. They liked working with each other. Hill would praise Rourke's commitment to the role. He said that Rourke understood the part so deeply that he rarely gave him direction. So yeah, not every director hated working with him. Some people like Mickey Rourke, wow. And yes, once again, everybody loved Mickey Rourke's acting, but nobody went to go see the movie. Then in 1990, he did two movies, Wild Orchid and Desperate Hours. He saw some awards love. Unfortunately, that love came from the Razzies, where he was nominated for Worst Actor in both of these forgettable films. In Wild Orchid, Mickey Rourke would again star in an erotic thriller. That was his thing. And of course it was too hot to handle. The MPAA deemed it too damn sexy and slapped an X rating on it, forcing them to cut down on the more uh, raunchy stuff. And there were even uh, rumors that Rourke and his female lead, Carrie Otis, weren't exactly acting in their love scenes, if uh, you know what I mean. But that's just a rumor. Those things would never happen in Hollywood. Wild Orchid. An adventure of the senses. And yeah, the two uh, were romantically involved in real life at the time, actually. And Miss Otis would later write a tell-all book about the dysfunctional relationship with Mickey, alleging abuse. And that's never good. Mickey Rourke was eventually arrested for spousal abuse, but the charges were later dropped. He denies the abuse still to this day, but he does agree that the relationship was very... dangerous and says that the abuse was not done by him, but but done by the people that Miss Otis was doing drugs with. I don't know who to believe, I just... Why do I even have to talk about these things? We should be talking about movies, but I guess we, we also should mention this. Don't... Don't hit people. This has been a public service announcement. Moving on, let's talk about movies, yeah! Then, uh, yeah, there was Desperate Hours! He reunited with his Heaven's Gate director, but the film was a critical and commercial flop. Mickey Rourke had steadily become disenfranchised with his acting career, feeling more and more like a sellout with each and every passing role. His next two films he would openly admit he did just for the paycheck. And those movies were the critically and commercial failures, Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man, and White Sands. And yeah, he did it for the money, and Mickey Rourke hated feeling like a sellout. You don't trust me. <laughs> Where's the money? At this time, Rourke had no respect for himself as an actor. So he decided to go back to the thing that he was good at as a teenager, boxing. And Rourke had a pretty successful run as a boxer. So I hear, I, I don't, I don't know. He said that he wanted to get back into the ring to test himself, physically. Well, he still had time. And of course, Mickey did just as much fighting outside of the ring as he did in. And since he was a world-famous actor, Mickey got many opportunities to get smacked around by some hard hitters. And since Mickey wanted to prove himself, he took those hits like a champ. Mickey was so dedicated to his boxing career that he actually turned down the role of Butch in Pulp Fiction, even though Quentin Tarantino really wanted him. Mickey didn't even read the script, but he was way too focused on his boxing training to deal with all that Tarantino stuff. Uh, Thomas McKay, and it's only a matter of time until he goes to the Boden geht and actually. During his career as a boxer, Mickey sustained many injuries, broken bones, concussions, you know, which resulted in him ultimately needing intense facial reconstruction surgery. They pretty much punched the pretty out of him. And some people believe that Mickey ruined his good looks on purpose. He always hated the fake glamour of Hollywood and their obsession with beauty. So it is quite possible that Mr. Mickey subconsciously wanted to destroy the thing that made him a movie star. And he soon became the poster boy for bad plastic surgery. And he kept fighting as long as he could until the doctors told him to stop. Like he was about to have some serious damage done if he didn't stop. Kind of like the movie Homeboy. Der schon wieder schwankt, 
Und jetzt wird Mickey Ward nach ein Aufwärtshaken. So this beaten and battered boxer went back to being a reluctant movie star. Or at least he tried. Then he did a few things in the 90s uh, that didn't really make much noise. There was HBO's The Last Outlaw in 1993. There was Fall Time in 1995. He did the erotic thriller thing again in Exit in Red, 1996. But he did play a villain in the now classic Dennis Rodman masterpiece, Double Team, in 1997. He at least seemed to be having fun in that one. He went on to write the script for Bullet, the classic pairing of Mickey and his good old buddy, Tupac. But none of these films saw any significant box office return. So now we have entered into the late 90s. And by this time, Rourke had really built up a reputation of being difficult to work with. He had taken a break from acting and saw his leading man good looks take a literal beating, but he still had his fans. And one of those fans happened to be his Rumblefish director, Francis Ford Coppola, who was looking for an actor who could command the screen in a supporting role as a shady ambulance chasing lawyer in the 1997 adaptation of John Grisham's The Rainmaker. And he also took on a supporting role as a ruthless bookie in one of the most influential and groundbreaking independent films of all time, like it or not, Buffalo 66. Now, I know what you're thinking, the story's hard to believe, right? It's directed by Crazy Man Vincent Gallo, and Crazy Man Vincent Gallo paid Mickey Rourke with a paper bag full of $100,000 cash. And Mickey actually does a wonderful job stepping out of his leading man comfort zone and playing strong supporting roles that demanded the audience's attention. And you know what, Mickey? You got it. But of course, in Hollywood, just as in regular life, you gotta pay the bills. And Mickey Rourke did just that with a string of direct-to-video duds. Movies like Thursday, Point Blank, Shades, Out in 50, Shergar. And he did an amazing, wonderful, amazing, just the best freaking job ever in Terrence Malick's Thin Red Line, but, but his, all of his scenes got cut, so. But then came the new millennium, that, that Y2K time. Most of the filmmakers in the world had pretty much given up on Mickey Rourke, but there were still a select few who believed. And Steve Buscemi actually happened to be one of those filmmakers, and he cast Mickey Rourke in his second directorial effort, Animal Factory. He played a transvestite, <laughs> and this was followed by Get Carter, where Sylvester Stallone wanted to work with Mickey Rourke so bad that he actually put up part of his salary as a guarantee when the studio officially refused to cast Mickey. But Rourke was on his best behavior for Get Carter, and his new professionalism made it easier for Sean Penn, a longtime Mickey Rourke fan, to cast him in his directorial effort, The Pledge in 2001, where Mickey would once again command the screen in a small role as a grieving father. His performance in these films, as well as his reported good behavior on those sets, helped filmmakers and studios realize that there was still more in the old Rourke tank, and he appeared in that steamy music video for Enrique Iglesias' Hero. I can be your hero, Mickey! And Mickey Rourke would pop up in a drug-fueled, crazy, crazy movie called Spun. And he would take a small role just because he wanted to work with Bob Dylan in a movie called Masked and Anonymous, which I hear is just horrible. But Bob Dylan was a big fan of Mickey Rourke, and Mickey Rourke is a big fan of Bob Dylan, so, you know, that's nice. Tony Scott would cast him in the Denzel Washington movie, Man on Fire. And Robert Rodriguez would cast him in the El Mariachi threequel, once upon a time in Mexico in 2003 and he is great in both of those movies perfect perfect this is this is the kind of stuff we want to see from you Mickey these are the kind of filmmakers you should be working with and he really liked working with Robert Rodriguez and Robert Rodriguez really liked working with Mickey and this collaboration would finally lead the way for Mickey to have a mainstream mega blockbuster hit and that movie was Sin City. Open up, police! I'll be right out. Robert Rodriguez was the perfect filmmaker to bring him back 
in a big way, casting Mickey as the anti-hero with a messed up face. Something that Mickey could relate to. And only Mickey could bring this comic book character to life. I mean, graphic novel character. Critics were very impressed with this film, calling it visually groundbreaking. And it was. And it was terrifically violent. Yes, it was. With most critics singling out Mickey Rourke's flawless performance. Mickey Rourke would win several awards for his acting in this one. The Chicago film critics gave him Best Supporting Actor. And with Robert Rodriguez keeping the budget at a pretty modest $40 million, the film pulled in a sizable $160 million worldwide. Sin City. Filmmaker Tony Scott must have really enjoyed working with Mickey Rourke on the set of Man on Fire because he would cast him again in the true life story of Domino. Mickey originally turned down the role, claiming that the script was weak, so Tony Scott rewrote the part specifically tailored to Mickey, which convinced him to take on the role. Then there was a supporting turn in a very forgettable movie called Stormbreaker about a kid who's a spy kid, but not a spy kid. And then he was arrested again in 2007 for drunk driving on a scooter. Don't do those things. This has been a, another public service announcement. He was almost stuntman Mike in Quentin Tarantino's Death Proof, but that didn't happen. And that would have really boosted his comeback a little bit more. But he did not need Quentin Tarantino. No, no, no. He had Darren Aaron 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 Aronofsky. Sorry, I always have a hard... Darren Aaron Ar... Darren... Darren Aaron Ar Aaron Arfsky. Aaron Arf I'm just Darren. You know, we're on a first name basis. And this man, Darren, would help Mickey Rourke redefine what a Hollywood comeback truly is. And Mickey Rourke would make the comeback of all comebacks playing the down and out professional wrestler Randy the Ram Robinson in. The Wrestler. The film's director, Darren, only wanted Mickey Rourke in the lead role. But the financiers were very hesitant to bank a movie with Rourke as the lead, due to his, uh, you know, reputation. And this actually forced Darren to cast Nicolas Cage as The Wrestler. But Nicolas Cage would eventually drop out because he knew that this part was made for Mickey and he graciously volunteered to drop out of the film because because he's Nicolas Cage, best human ever. And Darren really knew how to push Mickey's buttons to get the best performance out of the man, even challenging Mickey's manhood to trick him to go the extra mile in some uh, pretty gruesome stunts. And it worked. And the scene where Mickey Rourke is working behind a deli counter, well that was shot semi-gorilla style with real customers walking up to him. And he would actually take their real orders. I guess nobody recognized his, uh, his face. And just like in Buffalo 66, Mickey Rourke received his payment in a paper bag full of cash. The film was a critical hit and had universal praise for Mickey's performance that many hailed as not only the best of the year, but like one of the best performances of all time. I just don't want you to hate me. Okay? Sin City was his comeback, but The Wrestler was his resurrection. I remember reading that in a magazine or something a long time ago, and it always stuck with me, because it's so true. This was far beyond a comeback. This was a whole new Mickey, in a truly beautiful film. And as many of you know, Mickey went on to win the BAFTA and the Golden Globe for this wonderful performance. And he was by far the front runner to win the Oscar that year. But unfortunately, that was the same year that Sean Penn played Harvey Milk in the movie Milk and Rourke would remain an Oscar nominee. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And as good as Sean Penn is in Milk, I do have to say that Mickey Rourke was royally screwed out of the Oscar here. You know, Sean Penn was great, but Mickey Rourke was legendary. And I feel that the Academy was kind of, uh, I don't know, scared to give this unholy golden idol to a, to a movie about a wrestler. 
Some even claim that this film is an allegory for the United States of America. And yes, of course, when I first heard about this movie, I thought, like, what? It sounds like something Hulk Hogan should be in. That doesn't sound like a good movie. But those are my favorite kind of movies. The movies that shouldn't be good, but are. And The Wrestler is not only good, it's frickin' great. So yeah, Mickey, he was an Oscar nominee, the talk of the town. Everybody was like, what you gonna do next, Mickey? And sometimes when you get that Oscar bump, you still have a few skeletons in the closet that need to be released. And he had three of them. Killshot is based off of the Elmore Leonard novel, and it went direct to DVD. And there was 13, which is uh, an American remake. And even though both of the films had the same director, the remake was not as good. And there was The Informers, which only made $382,174 against an $18 million budget. Hey, Jackson. How's it hanging? What the fuck are you doing here? Now this is where we can see how a career-defining performance accompanied with an Oscar nomination can bring your career to the next level. So Rourke would sign on to play the villain role of Whiplash in the third film in the MCU, Iron Man Dose. Obviously this is Mickey Rourke's highest grossing film to date, pulling in just shy of $624 million worldwide. And Rourke did very deep research for the film truly diving into the character, you know, the method stuff. He would even visit a prison in Moscow to understand Russian criminals. And he suggested that half of his dialogue be in Russian. And Mickey Rourke said that he did not want to play a one-dimensional bad guy. And he wanted the audience to find something redeemable in him. He wanted the character to have layers. And Mickey gave him layers. So yeah, everything seems to be going wonderful for Mickey Rourke. He's in like the biggest movie at that time. He's riding high, everybody respects him, and they're all interested in what's he gonna do, you know? But this is the point of the story where Mickey Rourke decides to, uh, Rourke it. But of course, Rourke would publicly attack almost everyone involved in the movie. Yes. Whiplash went after the overlords at Marvel. And you don't do that kind of stuff, man. And perhaps since it was only the third film in what was going to be the biggest film series ever created, probably didn't realize what he was a part of and how big of a deal it was. Or he didn't give a fuck because, you know, he's Mickey Rourke. But Rourke took issue with the depth he wanted to bring to the character, putting in time to, you know, study Russian, and visit those prisons, and even paying out of his own pocket for character traits such as uh, golden teeth and the cockatoo. And he was so upset when Marvel decided they only wanted to portray him as a one-dimensional villain. So they chopped him up and left all of his good stuff on the cutting room floor. How dare they! And in all honesty, I, you know, I fully understand Mickey Rourke's point of view on this. So in the end, all of that hard work was for nothing, and that really pissed Mickey off, and uh, you don't want to piss Mickey Rourke off. And even though he probably shouldn't have burnt those bridges and bit those hands that were feeding him, I kind of respect Mickey for sticking to his guns, or his... his whips. He never backed down, even despite of his career. <laughs> he, uh, he truly believes in Mickey Rourke. Then in 2010, Mickey Rourke was a part of the huge ensemble cast of The Expendables. Rourke said that he took on the role as a favor to Sylvester Stallone to pay him back for his support on Get Carter. When Mickey Rourke was in a very low career slump, Sylvester Stallone believed in him. Then there was Passion Play. Mickey Rourke would star alongside Bill Murray in a film that critics called an absolute train wreck. And not the good kind of train wreck the bad kind. Mickey openly admitted that he did the film for the money. Mickey, if you're gonna do films for money, you should do Marvel films for money. I don't, I don't get you, but I still kind of like you. Then in 2011 came Immortals. This was Mickey Rourke's last big budget project. It's about Greek gods. 
the film was given mediocre reviews, with most critics liking the visuals but saying that the story was uh, lame and boring. But worldwide audiences saved the film from financial disappointment because it pulled in under uh, $227 million from a $75 million budget. So that's good. Mickey's reputation again would take a hit due to several well-publicized on-set dust-ups. And back into relative obscurity he went. Again. And big name directors were no longer willing to take a chance on poor old Mickey. Like with the movie Seven Psychopaths, the director basically kicked him off the film. He had been banished to the directed DVD bin. Making movies like Black November, Java Heat, Dead in Tombstone, Ashby, Skin Traffic, War Pigs, Blunt Force Trauma, Weaponized. He did make a return as Marv in a sequel to Sin City, A Dame to Kill For, but unlike the first film, this one failed to do anything. It had been way too long and even the biggest Sin City fans really didn't care anymore. We wanted to care, but this was the biggest disappointment of that year. Also in that same year, 2014, Mickey Rourke decided to return to the boxing ring at the age of 62 or somewhere around there. On November 28, 2014, Mickey Rourke fought 29-year-old boxer Elliot Seymour in Moscow. It was his first fight in 20 years, and Mickey Rourke actually won by a technical knockout. But of course, with all things Mickey Rourke, there was a bit of a controversy, because Seymour later claimed that he was paid to take a dive. In 2017, he decided to take it easy and appear as himself in a Showtime series called Dice, starring Andrew Dice Clay. Sometimes he's funny. But then came the year 2020, and he had a movie called Girl that had 64% on Rotten Tomatoes, that's pretty good. And he also had a movie called The Legion, which had 0% on Rotten Tomatoes, that's not very good. And if you think Mickey Rourke is slowing down, well, you're wrong. He currently has nine films in various stages of production, so we're about to see Mickey. Which Mickey will we see? <laughs> you never know. But the last major thing Mickey Rourke has been seen doing is probably one of the most bizarre and fun things he's ever done. I present to you Mickey Rourke's finest performance to date as the Gremlin in season four of the popular Illuminati humiliation ritual, The Masked Singer. And in true Mickey Rourke fashion, he decided to not play by the rules and be the first person in the show's history to unmask himself. OMG, WTF. He ruined their party, but it's Mickey Rourke, so f it. And I'm sure this is not the first musical eyes wide shut ceremony that Mickey Rourke has interrupted. I say let's go for We've it. lost control, it's go. the Gremlin Show. Go. So after decades of drugs, Hollywood smack talk, burning bridges, run-ins with the law, lots of punching, botched plastic surgeries, more drugs, more punching, and a very, very bad boy reputation, all of those things turned this sexy superstar into a leather-faced madman with a heart of gold because he likes chihuahuas. And only the coolest, bestest people in the world like these little things. I have a few myself, I'm just saying. And Mickey actually claims that these dogs are the sole reason why he didn't kill himself a few years ago. He literally lives for these pups. Wow, that's like really adorable and sweet and like sad and beautiful. Life would imitate art and art would imitate life many times for Mickey. Whether he's playing a troubled kid from the streets, a boxer with something to prove, a man with a messed up face, a down-on-his-luck has-been fighting for a comeback, or even a Russian supervillain. He's really good friends with Putin, by the way. Just saying. <laughs> the real Mickey and the characters he brings to life seem to intertwine cinema with reality to create a one-of-a-kind actor, Mickey Rourke.
He came on strong in the 80s, often drawing comparisons to the legendary Marlon Brando. Then, at the height of his fame, when his career could have taken him anywhere, he dropped out to pursue a different passion. And when he returned to acting, it was obvious that something had changed. The man who was once Johnny Handsome no longer was. Beautiful on the inside, though, Mickey. Sometimes. But Hollywood loves a comeback story. His role in The Wrestler will go down in history as one of the best performances ever. So great that they ever make a Mount Rushmore of great performances? They're putting his face on there. I just hope the sculptor is better than the plastic surgeon. Unfortunately, Mickey Rourke couldn't seem to get out of his own way, and the problems of his early career are still biting him in the ass. He went from difficult to work with to, uh, maybe he's matured to, nope, still the same old Mickey. And I do think we are going to see more amazing performances from Rourke. I, I have faith. I'm sure there's some director out there who's gonna take a chance on this man. And then we will all be reminded why Mickey f***ing Rourke is the legend he is. And that's what the f*** happened to Mickey Rourke. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We're an independent company, and we appreciate all your support.